Hey, good afternoon. It is Patrick Lovell, Truth Bomb Riffing on Friday, November 10th at 1.47 p.m. my time. And, um, you know, I, I woke up this morning to a slew of information, news, reports, and, you know, the like, that we're dealing primarily with anti-Semitism or the rise of anti-Semitism. And uh, I have addressed this subject before. Uh, one of my 400, and I believe I'm up to 424 truth bombs in the span of about a year and a half. Um, you can search it out. I think I put it in the log line, anti-Semitism. Um, and I've addressed this before, but I think I need to address it again because I'm compelled to, you know. I have no idea how many people are going to see this. I certainly hope many, many, many people um, over the course of time, however and whenever they discover this. But, um, you know, the shit's getting real, as they say. And, uh, you know, depending on where you come from is, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, justifiably so. Uh, or you might be saying, yeah, and this is completely fucked up beyond recognition. And um, I am myself Jewish. I'm a reform Jew. I am a guy with a Irish name, Patrick, and an English last name, Lovell. And uh, my middle name, by the way, is Stuart, which is Scottish. So I always found it interesting. My parents named me after the British Isles. But uh, my father's family is English and German and not of the Jewish persuasion. Uh, my mother's family is, and they were from Ukraine. And they were from Ukraine on both sides of the fence, and they were part of the pogroms that were, you know, the um, inspiration behind Fiddler on the Roof, if you know that wonderful story. And um, my grandfather was all in Jewish Zionist. He wasn't an Orthodox Jew. He was pretty, quite frankly, secular, if you want to know the truth. But uh, he was a huge inspiration to me. He was a cross between... George Burns and Winston Churchill in terms of his kind of motif and his his sort of style. He had a cigar in his hands at all time and he loved to golf and that's where he did his business. He used to tell me things like you drive for show and you putt for dough. And his favorite saying, as I said at the top of my film, Ford 13, Waking Up the American Dream, was I love the Rocky Mountains, the skyscrapers of Manhattan and the 4th of July because you're always looking up. And he was a huge influence on me. And my dad's side of the family is all Christian. And so, you know, I grew up with this sort of, um, I don't know, jocularity, if you will, but also kind of a pasha towards anti-Semitism, whereas I just was like, it's the dumbest fucking thing of all time. And I became obsessed with Hitler as I grew up. I, I ended up learning just about everything you could possibly learn about the Holocaust. And I ultimately learned from that, um, you know, pretty deep dive into anti-Semitism, which I always found extremely interesting. And um, in a huge part of my cosmetic makeup, I suppose. I mean, you know, my Jewishness, if you want to know the truth, I'm, you know, I'm not kosher. I'm not orthodox. I'm, I'm in it for the pastrami and uh, the jokes, you know, I mean, in the music, quite frankly. I mean, look, I'm Jewish like the Beastie Boys or, you know... Um, Let's think of some of my favorite Jews. I mean, across the board, comedians, Larry David, Mel Brooks, right? Uh, Rodney Dangerfield. You know, I'll be in that that uh, group of people all day, every day, um, and, and, and many more. Fantastic writers, William Burroughs. I mean, the list goes, you know, to infinity, not to mention musicians and and scientists and so forth. But, I, you know, in my personal life, like, like I said, the Beastie Boys or Perry Farrell from Jane's Addiction or, boy, who was the uh, – I want to think of his name. He was one of the founders of the Red Hot Chili Peppers alongside, of course, Flea and um, – God, what was his name? I should look it up. But anyway, it will come back to me in a little bit. But he was originally from Israel. Not to mention like Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley of Kiss, you know, and there's all sorts of fantastic rockers and poets and, you know, just a lot of smart people. And when you think about, you know, I, I don't know, actors, the list goes on and on and on. I mean – you know, interestingly enough, in my life, I I, uh, I dated mostly blonde, beautiful women, mostly Scandinavians. I just always loved blonde chicks. And uh, not to say I wasn't interested in Jewish chicks. I just never really met any. Maybe I lived in too many waspish sort of neighborhoods growing up, which I kind of did. Um, you know, but the long of the, the 
you know, the lay of the land was, you know, I, I was totally attracted to, to blonde women. Why? Because they're beautiful. I think all women are beautiful, quite frankly. I think all people are beautiful. But yeah, in my personal life, I dated a lot of blonde women and married one. Um, my wife of 22 years is as Scandinavian as it gets, blonde, blue eyed. And she gave birth to our gorgeous son, who reminds me, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, you know, I think of uh, Zac Efron because he gets compared to Zac Efron all the time. And I learned that Zac Efron's Jewish, which I thought was interesting with those incredible blue eyes. You know, there's a lot of Hollywood uh, people that are beautiful, that are Jewish and very successful. But, you know, I think of Goldie Hawn and Kate Hudson and, and many others. But, um, yeah, my, my, my flavor was, quite frankly, a lot of Scandinavian women. And forever, forever how that turned out, I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe I had kind of an inner sort of like, fuck you to Hitler sort of thing. But that's not why. I just happened to meet a lot of really beautiful, cool blonde chicks. And... Um, you know, interestingly enough, I, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I like a lot of Jewish chicks just in terms that are out there. Like, for example, I was listening this afternoon to Alt Nation Madison, who is a fantastic DJ. Boy, I hope I cross paths with her someday because I think she's fantastic. You know, but my point about bringing all of those types of people up is, A, they're incredibly talented and cool and fantastic. And, um, you know, but B, through the long lens of anti-Semitism, you know, you know, one thing I guess I want to, I guess, touch upon is sort of a tradition of Jewish people of not bending the knee, really. Um, throughout a thousand years of anti-Semitism, you know, growing up, I had a chip on my shoulder. And quite frankly, as I described, you know, coming from the family I did, I, you know, wasn't afraid to get into fights. And I got into tons of fights. And I, and I actually relished getting into physical fights. I'm 55 years old now, so I don't do that anymore because I've learned that you don't want to go down that path and get in a lot of trouble with the law and that sort of thing. But that was my background, so I was never afraid of really anyone. And, um, you know, um, the anti-Semitism thing that, you know, I delved into, you know, that was, you know, pre-Holocaust and everything else. And, and, and I think many of you who have any education understand that there was a lot of groups throughout history that have been targeted for some sort of, you know, polarization or, uh, you know, uh, quite frankly, you know, the minorities a lot of the times become victimized by the majority in whatever situation it might be, whether it's the Celtics and, you know, there's a long laundry list of every single country throughout the history or region that has this sort of story. But in the case of Jews, a lot of the time, the Jews didn't bend the knee to incorporate and kiss the ring quite frankly. Now, a lot obviously did. There were things like we have throughout, you know, the Middle Ages, the Inquisition. And I only smile thinking of Mel Brooks, the Inquisition, <laughs> or Monty Python. No laughing matter, obviously, that the uh, war on Judaism was, was significant and a lot of people were tortured and they suffered. And, you know, a lot of Jews converted and under really extreme circumstances and sometimes you know, I think about it and I'm like, yeah, can you blame them? But at the same time, there was a lot of Jews who didn't conform and they stuck it out and they stayed true to their beliefs and they ended up being murdered, horrifically murdered over and over and over. And meanwhile, what did the Jewish people do? They continued to create, they continued to learn, they continued to foster science and have giant impact on the world writ large, considering Ultimately, throughout the years, their numbers were obviously dwindling because of violence and death and persecution. And, you know, I take great pride in an in, in incredible connection and love to this tradition of, quite frankly, not conforming and, and holding true to one's beliefs. And, uh, you know, do I subscribe to the chosen people and you know, it's our purpose from God to educate the world of God's laws and that sort of thing. You know, as as a child growing up, as a teenager to a degree, but not really always kind of loosely looking at the whole playing field and really getting to the point of like, it's all ridiculous to begin with. It's just power. It's a power grab. It's people. It's organization. No matter where you are in the world, humanity operates under the same psychological constructs. And conformity and complicity to the power is ultimately the deal. And that's why we have wars over and over and over and we're violent people. And that's our natural tendency as humans, quite frankly. 
even though humans also are creative and peaceful at the same time. So we're a contradiction. There's many Jews in, um, you know, both categories, quite frankly. And, um, you know, but the theme is that, you know, Jews survived and against incredible odds. And really the, the genius of a lot of Jews was from the tradition of the intellectual discipline of studying Talmud and debating the between the lines of, of what Talmud reads. And, and that's the tradition. And, you know, in terms of the kind of a hierarchy of, of Jewish society, you know, I'm reminded that it's really the rabbis, right, that have a special place. I mean, they're not the butchers. They're not the farmers. They're not the guys that go out and do the physical labor. They are the guys who, you know, can understand the, the details. And in a lot of ways, it's incredibly patriarchal and mass. Mas- misogynistic yeah and all that kind of stuff you know and and that was the tradition but from that tradition over centuries and an eon in eons quite frankly um you know a lot of genius people that have had an incredible impact on the world were born against all odds and it's it's an incredible story and that's not to say that that doesn't happen in every religion or culture because it does but it does in the a jewish you know um sort of story in a pretty significant way. And it's incredible when we look at the nature of anti-Semitism in 2023, you know, the population of Jews around the world is is tiny, but yet this scenario has got the attention of literally billions of people around the world because of this endless tragedy and, and this endless hate and this endless thing. And yet I have been addressing some of the most uncomfortable and, uh, inconvenient truths in, in some of my previous truth bombs and I'll address them again. But, but I want to start from this construct. So, you know, one of the long standing sort of perceptions of Jews is this sort of world global domination by this small cabal of evil people that run the show, media, finance, and whatever else of power, right? And that was born, again, a millennial ago. I mean, I don't know how long blood libel has been around, which, of course, transitioned to the things that were happening with the Democrats, I guess, going back to Pizzagate. But the idea of Jews sucking the blood of innocent Christian children, for example, was this horrific setup, you know, uh, to, to further justify and uh, adorn, if you will, you know, the, the, the sort of juxtaposition of, of anti-Semitism in, uh, throughout Western Europe particularly, but um, the confounding scenarios that, you know, Jews would ultimately throughout this time, uh, A, you know, be kind of moved into their own communities of which we end up with a lot of, I, I, I would hate to say, but probably intermarriage, interbreeding to a degree. I think that happens to have a lot of ultimately characteristics of Jewish people, because from what I understand, Jews aren't a race. But at the same time, there is a lot of characteristics of similarities, particularly large noses, of which I have one, obviously. And I would never, um, you know, have a nose job to save my life because I wear it with great pride. In fact, in the old days, I used to use it as bait against guys who didn't like Jews. I'd be like, you know what? Fucking take a shot, motherfucker. And yeah, we'd go down. And a lot of times I won. Sometimes I didn't. But I always fucking threw down. And, you know, that's my come from. Because I know that if you don't fight for your survival... People will gladly murder you because that's the sickness of humanity. But I don't, you know, foster or sort of celebrate violence. I'm like, that's just part of the fucking game, unfortunately, most of the time. And going back to, you know, the nature of this sort of uh, contradictions that, you know, as time uh, moved forward and all of these things got further and further entrenched, you had these other things that took place, for example, that because of the tradition of studying Talmud and debate and everything else that lent itself to the scholastic tradition and this discipline, yeah, Jews were pretty freaking smart. And so a lot of them became financiers and did really a lot of uncomfortable work for the power of Western Europe, which were the monarchies or the families. And yeah, it led to, you know, I, I don't want to call it central banking. I We all, you know, have heard uh, about the Rothschilds, and of course, that's kind of a go-to right now for a lot of anti-Semites that the Roth, Rothschilds rule the world, although 
from where I'm sitting, the Rothschilds don't have, you know, any vestige of power compared to those that are right in front of us that I continue to bring to your attention. But, you know, it's easier for people to lend, you know, to, to lean on, you know, all of these, you know, tribulations of history. And it's just mind blowingly, mind numbingly fucking stupid, but it, it always has been and it always will be. And so there's these massive contradictions and there's these things that are just like so awful and so horrible. And then you fast forward to what's happening because of Gaza and because of the battle between, let's say, Hamas and the Israeli Defense Force, if you want to kind of be a little bit more technical, versus the Palestinian people and the Jewish people, but both are extensions of both of those people, not to mention Hezbollah and everything else that radiates from this this situation that have you know been around for a long time. Uh, again, I mentioned that the most recent sort of incarnation is, of course, of 1948 onward, the establishment of the Jewish state based on the Balfour Direct Declaration, based on things that had manifested long before that through Zionism and everything else. But that goes back thousands of years, you know, back to the Roman uh, Pontius Pilate and Empire, you know, evicting uh, Jews from Judea and renaming it Palestine. That's part of the story, too. But now we, we see this, this incredible, you know, marches in the streets of Europe uh, and, of course, on college campuses. And I find it really interesting, the conversation about anti-Semitism as it relates to people reacting, particularly I just saw this morning, Jonathan Goldblatt, Greenblatt, uh, and he was on, and I don't watch it all the time. I just tune in every once in a while, but, you know, on MSNBC's Morning Joe, and it was like the thing that they were like, you know, him and Joe Scarborough were talking about, this is unacceptable, the anti-Semitism on campus, and we're going to use the full measure of the law to rein it in, and we're going to use our leverage with donors and our leverage with university presidents. And they're talking primarily Again, being somewhat ironic, but at the same time, an expression of what it is that I'm saying is that these are mostly Ivy League schools where they have this influence because there's a lot of Jewish students and there's a lot of Jewish alumni and there's a lot of Jewish money involved with these elite institutions. And, you know, about, what, two months ago, we saw incredible anti-Semitism from Nazis, you know, showing swastikas in front of Disneyland or Disney World, sorry, Disney World and on the top of overpasses in Orlando, right? And when I looked at those pictures of those those uh, those skinheads and these, you know, and I was reminded, quite frankly, it was interesting because I, 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 I had actually made a mention on, on um, Twitter on X. I said, you know, these guys remind me of Hamas or Hezbollah because they were wearing, you know, the handkerchiefs over their faces. And, you know, when I looked in their face and their eyes, they look like I don't know, high schoolers, and they didn't look very intimidating to me, to be honest with you, but they kind of came and went, right? I mean, it was it was horrific when I was watching this thing, but not to mention all of the anti-Semitic crimes that preceded it, but, you know, these scenarios where, you know, Governor Ron DeSantis is like flouting this thing in open space as part of kind of a MAGA thing. But here's the other sort of conundrum pretzel logic scenario that We've seen since the war in Hamas has started, and, and many of us have known this for a long time, that, yeah, there's a lot of MAGA that are extremely supportive of Israel. And they've been deeply involved and enmeshed with the settlements and involved with, quite frankly, Trump. But that, you know, ties back to Sheldon Adelson and, you know, the billionaire funded sort of West Bank settlements and, you know, how that sort of equates in the Israeli, you know, political dynamic of Netanyahu and where the IDF was before the October 7th attacks and all of that sort of thing. And, um, you know, it's just this peculiar, you know, scenario, but it all is kind of straightforward at the same time because, you know, Israel, a lot of the powers that be on the right wing sort of uh, apparatus of the Israeli sort of uh, political dynamic, you know, have been playing ball with evangelicals for now decades. And as anyone knows who understands why the evangelicals are interested in Israel is because, of course, the nature of Armageddon or, um, you know, what do they call it? Uh, the uh, it'll come to my mind in just a second. The, uh, you know, we're basically the, the, the final war between good and evil and it usher in the opportunity for the second coming and all the souls will go to heaven and the destruction of the non-believers and which means the destruction of Israel, Israelis that have never accepted Christianity. Right. Because 
they didn't accept as their Messiah, the Jewish rabbi who was trying to start a revolution based on the premise of the ideology of Exodus and really kind of the nature of what Judaism was to fight tyranny. And I'm talking about Jesus, the original, you know, uh, rabbi that is depicted throughout Christianity as some Nordic God. Ironically, that takes me back to my son who looks like a Nordic God because he's as blue eyes as it gets. And I was talking to my son recently about anti-Semitism and I was like, look, dude, you don't have to worry about it because they all think you're one of them, right? So it's like, I'm like, I, I'm saying it kind of sarcastically and making my, myself sick at the same time, but I'm not a religious guy. Like I said at the beginning, I'm, you know, I, I believe in Judaism because of Exodus, because of the story of, of uh, Moses. I love the fight against tyranny and I loved it, you know, going into the Ten Commandments minus, you know, the really ridiculous, you know, oath to God, even though I probably... Uh, will be hated by many people as a result of that. But I love the common sense rules of society that led to Deuteronomy and Leviticus, of which, you know, this is the structure of society that ends up having this through line all the way, you know, several thousand years later into the United States, quite frankly. And I've, I've done that truth bomb on 13 and everything that that elucidates. But, you know, going back to anti-Semitism, I mean, you know, look, I, I've seen the videos recently of children in Hamas having their heads blown apart. Yeah, I saw that. It quite frankly reminded me of the two shows that I had recommended to you guys that I saw that I thought really captured the essence of World War II, particularly from an American ex perspective. One was Band of Brothers um, about really the, the, the 101st Airborne landing behind enemy lines during D-Day and their march all the way to Berlin. Um, to win the World War II, and then the other one was, of course, the Pacific, in which case both of those shows showed over and over and over the carnage and obviously their make-believe, but with a bunch of heads blown apart. And so when I saw the real thing with these children from Hamas, I mean, excuse me, of Palestine in Gaza, you know, as a human being, I'm, I'm absolutely horrified. And then I'm absolutely aware of all the tunnels, and I'm absolutely aware of Hamas's proclamation to bury Israel. And I'm aware of anti-Semitism. I'm, I'm aware of the Israelis' plight at the moment, where it's like they've been battling this situation and being kind of, you know, divided and polarized for a very long time between those of Reformed Judaism that are like me, that believe in democracy and the rule of law, that were protesting against, you know, Netanyahu's corruption and trying to basically, um, you know, pull the Supreme Court in Israel to do the bidding of his party sort of thing. I mean, like I've said many times before, and it's not because I'm ultra liberal, but I'm progressive, but I'm a pragmatist, but at the same time, I'm also a revolutionary. And all of these things that I'm talking about from all throughout history have their sort of, I don't know, their, their ingredients in my perspective and who I've always been and who I will always be and what I've always done and what I will always continue to do, which brings me to why... I'll say again what nobody else will say in, in the world. But I've got to get out in front of this because I know at some point this is going to come to a head. There's nothing I despise more than anti-Semitism. I, among many things that are extremely important to me, probably in the top three, is never again. Meaning never again another Holocaust, never again a mass wipeout of Jews, never again, uh, you know, this this unbridled, uh, you know, hatred that just murders and maims for no reason other than control, of which, of course, as I've just demonstrated through this truth bomb, thousands of years of Jews have not bent the knee because they believed in God and liberty. And, you know, the, the disciple, the, 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 what did not minority say? The, the principles of God, you know, and, and these are higher powers. And, and Jews don't necessarily believe in heaven, even though they do or they, die, it's complicated. It's, it's not like the way it is in Christianity, but at the same time, there is this Messiah and there's, you know, it, it, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that side of that, that side of the house. But what, what I, what I do understand is that you can't tolerate hatred. And so you might say to yourself, well, Patrick, don't be a fucking hypocrite. The, what, what the madness is that that's going on with Netanyahu and bombing indiscriminately, you know, in Gaza with thousands of children dying is unacceptable. 
And to me, it isn't acceptable, but it's, it's a conundrum because never would I ever want children murdered uh, or maimed or you know, destroyed or innocent people. But I'm like, I, I, I brought to you this to your attention earlier uh, with, 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 with the, the sort of cultural, you know, ramifications of game, uh, game, game of Thrones, the, the entire depiction of Daenerys Targaryen throughout her entire story arc was that she was going to break the wheel no matter what. And so when she winds up in King's Landing and there's this whole to do, you know, from Tyrion Lannister that you can't destroy the innocent and you've got to win them over. But ultimately she's like, fuck that. You can't root out, um, you know, um, <laughs> my God, how could I not? Cersei Lannister. Yeah, You can't root out Cersei Lannister without taking the whole thing out because she's entrenched herself in the city and surrounded herself and protected herself, you know, with what they're saying in Gaza, right? That Hamas is using these people as human shields, which they are. And it's fucked up. It should, this should, it should have been rooted out decades ago, but it wasn't. What we've done over and over and over, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's in the United States, whether it's throughout the world, the power has continued to conflate and create these insane scenarios Primarily but, but by these economic conundrums and paradigms, I say built on corruption. If you want to know the truth, I, I, everything comes back to, for me, based on what I've learned since I've started this journey 13 years ago, when I created my first documentary, where I got to, you know, Washington, D.C., when I was, uh, you know, I was... I was basically approaching what I what I what felt like Oz. It felt like the journey of Oz. In fact, on that journey, I actually went to the museum uh, where they have the original uh, Oz that Frank Lloyd Baum had written. And what an incredible story! And it turns out that it was located the original book, the original manuscript, in the World Trade Center. And a day before 9/11 was miraculously shipped back to its museum in Kansas, which I found really interesting when I was there. Because this whole story of the Wizard of Oz, as I was basically making my own parallel journey, I went from the Northwest to the Occupy Wall Street movement all the way through the Southwest, all the way through the United States. And I was on my way to, um, you know, D.C. and New York. And I stopped off in Kansas on the way, which is an amazing scenario to learn that, but to really, you know, learn more about the Wizard of Oz. And as I was approaching New York and, and D.C., I was putting all of these things together in my head and I was overcome because I had just gone to... Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where I literally dropped my body and I, I baptized myself in the mud of Shanksville, where, you know, flight uh, 90, you know, uh, with, with, with the heroes and, you know, and there's a lot of people who, who to this day think that, that d this didn't happen, but it did, where, you know, the heroes of flight 90 overcame the, uh, you know, the, the, the terrorists and took it down and it went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And I remember being inspired in, in my colleague, Eric Vaughn, who was filming me at the, at the time, thought I went into Colonel Kurtz mode, you know, the guy from, of course, um, uh, well, the wonderful fucking movie in the 60s. No, what am I talking about? In the 70s. Oh, God. Again, in the heart of darkness, that was the book. Of course, Apocalypse Now, right? Colonel Kurtz. He was like, dude, you're like Colonel Kurtz, man. He was pissed off because I got in the mud and I got his car dirty. That's another story. But I baptized myself in the in the mud of 9-11, which was part and parcel of my journey. And I'm getting to Washington, D.C. And I said to Eric on the as we're, you know, driving into, you know, kind of our last vestiges of the 75 hundred mile journey that I got a lot of these truths that I carried with me. I said, there's two columns of our soul, man. I said on one column of our soul is character, integrity, and dignity. And on the other side of our soul is hypocrisy, duplicity, and complicity. And the situation, based on the moment of what we're all in the midst of at any time of our lives, no matter what time in history, you know, the direction we go is depending on the circumstances. And if you've got courage and you've got integrity, you stick with it, come hell or high water, which quite frankly, a lot of Jews have done to their own demise. And maybe I am doing that as well. I don't know. But at the same time, you know, to bring it all full circle, <sighs> the nature and the magnitude of these horrific memes, if you will, throughout history of anti-Semitism, that the Jews run media and they run 
finance. And so they run the world. So therefore, they're the villains behind the scenes that are corrupting influence, that are destroying everyone. I'd say for the most part throughout history, I'd never in a million years buy that. Even though I knew a lot of very successful people in all of those places. But it wasn't until I got to my understanding of the con that I understood there's a lot of really stupid, shameless Jewish people that are involved in finance and media. And shame on them, given the spectrum in my knowledge and understanding of never again. Shame on these people, because as I've said in my previous truth bombs, that there are Jews at the hierarchy of finance and the law and media that buried the world with the 2008 great financial crisis and hit it and then bailed out the worst people in the world. Many of these people at the very top of the apex of all of these scenarios were Jewish, are Jewish. And what I say, and I need you to hear me, please understand what I'm saying because I'm trying to get out in front of what's coming. It's not because they're Jewish. Nowhere in Talmud does it teach you to do this type of behavior. Same could be said for the mafia in Christian teachings and everything else that came from racketeering and all of these horrific sorts of things throughout history. And you could probably say the same of the Saudi monarchy on behalf of Islam. As far as I understand, think about the three biggest prophets of the three largest monotheistic religions that come from the tradition of Abraham, whether it's Moses, whether it's Jesus Christ, whether it's Muhammad, from what I understand, every single one of them, think about that, one of three, we're fighting corruption. And yet all of their disciples throughout history, each one of them, doesn't matter who, they were all engaged somehow, some way in the betrayal of mankind. And deceptive acts and practices and murder and power and all of these types of things that happen over and over and over in history. And everyone is guilty. Not everyone is true. Everyone, let's put it this way, there are good and bad people in every single religion. And what I'm trying to tell you is that the, the, the Robert Rubin, Larry Levitt, above all, Alan Greenspan, and many, many, many others, I could go, the list is very, very long. They didn't do this because they were taught this as Jews. They're assholes. They're fucking greedy motherfuckers. And it's not because they're Jewish. It's not because they're Jewish. There were black people. There were uh, women. There were uh, Greek, you know, Christian. Uh, they, all men are shapes or sizes of people from different cultural and traditional backgrounds were involved at every level of thievery. Yeah, it just so happens that a guy, a bunch of guys at the top of this whole business, not to mention Les Moonves and, you know, fucking Zucker and all of these other idiots, you know, like what, what is that guy from CNN who's, I, I, can't, I despise this guy, you know, they're all like, they cherry pick the shit, you know, they, yeah, they're all Jews. And they were all making stupid fucking decisions over and over and over. And here I am, Patrick Lovell, in the flesh, man, born of, you know, I call it, you know, a Christian and in and, and Jewish backgrounds, but I, I chose Judaism. I grew up Jewish. My bar mitzvah, you know, I, uh, yeah, I didn't really choose Judaism. If you think about it, my mom was Jewish, and so you're considered Jewish, and I was raised Jewish. And there it goes. And that's all there was to it. Many years later as an adult, you know, I could go to any religion I want. And I have dated girls that are Catholic and I've gone to church and all sorts of stuff. But I've always been Jewish. And, um, you know, the nature of uh, – where do I want to kind of tie this together? Oh, yeah, I guess I want to bring it to this, right? So let's think about, you know, the um, – Let's think about Armageddon. Let's think about why, why, I, I don't know why I can't think of the goddamn term. You know, where everything is supposed to be clean. It's the end of the world, the battle between good and evil, where, you know, uh, the Christ comes back and ushers in this, 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 this great, you know, second coming and all that kind of stuff. It, I, I'm not that guy. 
Okay. Because a, I don't believe in myth and I don't believe in hocus pocus bullshit and I don't believe in anything else, but here are some of the corollaries. Okay. I went to the ends of the earth and back with a Jewish guy, by the way, who, who backed this. And I found a lot of Jewish people who were the good guys in this story who didn't play ball and who were guys at the apex of the attorneys and, uh, you know, accountants and everything else that happened to be Jewish that did all the right stuff. So you need to be aware of that as well. But we went out and got the fucking truth of the largest criminal conspiracy and cover up in history that never ended. That is the corruption of the system that has corrupted and perverted the fucking world that has led that is going to lead to more and more and more devastation until tens of millions of you come on board with me. And together we rise a tidal wave crusade to purge corruption and the fascism that it fuels. That's what I'm doing. If you, me, and everybody you see who isn't a Nazi, who believes in decency and, and dignity and integrity and liberty and justice for all and sustainability and beauty, and we come together and we, um, you know, unite in unity, we will defeat the misery of tyranny. This is the story of history. And so is that the second coming? Well, if it ushers in, you know, a world of peace and harmony, maybe. That's what I'm doing with the Clean New Deal. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. And that's who I am. So you put that into your filter. You put it into how you see the world and you do everything else, you know. But if you're going to judge me, you know, and you're going to put me in a category, put me in a category, again, with Slovak from the Red Hot Chili Peppers or the Beastie Boys or Perry Farrell of, uh, you know, uh, Jane's Addiction. I mean, I, this is my tradition, if you want to know the truth, my culture. That's where I come from. And I think all people are beautiful or potentially beautiful or capable of beauty. I think everybody deserves to live. I think that the magnitude and the horror of people suffering around the world in, in one form or another is, is insane. But at the same time, you know, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that believes in a social net safety net in democratic socialism to a degree, but you got to have the, the freedom and the capacity of people making, you know, breakthroughs in science and technology and money is definitely an incentive and in how that whole thing works to be able to get things funded and everybody's got to get paid no matter what, no matter who we are, capital is currency. And we all have to be able to, you know, uh, exist in this world unless you go independent and those who do are magnificent beings that are way stronger than I am. There's no way I could go out and, you know, live without energy and technology and grow my own food and hunt my own food and do that 24 seven and live to survive. That's not me. You know, again, I'd rather go and I miss completely, man. My God, did I love the, um, oh God, what is my favorite uh, deli in New York that got shut down a long time? The Carnegie Deli. Oh my God. The sandwiches there, the matzo ball soup. Are you kidding? The pictures of Mel Brooks and some of the greatest actors and everybody across the board. And I'm a producer. That's what I am. And I'll finish up on this. Anti-Semitism is fucking bullshit. Anybody who hates for the sake of hate is a fucking idiot and a motherfucking moron. And pardon my, you know, French, I'll probably be, you know, bounced out of YouTube for, you know, saying what's on my mind. But I hate hatred. I do. But I understand history and you've got to fight hatred in every form. And does that give you, you know, what my end game is in Gaza? I kind of threw up my arms a long time ago when I realized nobody was going to try to be able to pull off a two-state solution. When I saw Israel, you know, creating a relationship with Saudi Arabia, based on what I said before in one of my truth bombs, where I was like, you know, Israel made itself indispensable to all of the oligarchs and the oil oligarchs in the vicinity, which of course, the American dollar and its geo, um, you know, uh, its global currency and all of the rest of it depend on. I mean, I'm trying to create a paradigm change with the Clean New Deal to purge corruption to get us off of fossil fuel because I've shown you over and over and over, and I will until I'm dead, that it's $70 trillion since 2009 that's gone to backstop this fucking monstrosity that's leading to another degree of carnage, whether it's anti-Semitism on a global scale or World War III. It's fucking crazy. At what point in time has it not been crazy? The American Revolution, the Civil War, when we won, when the good guys won, the Civil Rights Movement, the New Deal, quite frankly, trust busting. Oh, you know, and another two that I want to um, compare, not compare myself, but be in the same kind of frame. 
it, loosely, Bob Marley. Exodus, Movement of Jai People, The Lion of Zion. I mean, you know, Heli Selassie, the, the Lost Tribe of Ethiopia and Israel. Yeah, there's a lot of continuity there as well, my friends. And by the way, growing up, I'll, I'll be honest with you, all my Jewish friends, they smoked more, more dope than anybody I've ever seen. They were freaking Rastas. All of my Jewish friends were the biggest potheads I've ever met. And you know why? Probably everything I just laid out. Because they, you know all this stuff. And it's like, why the fuck do people hate us? We've got to overcome hatred. Onwards and upwards. Failure is not an option. Rise, roar, revolt. The clean new deal now.